Welcome to our service today, and thank you for joining us from wherever you may be at this time. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we come to a time of confession. Let's just take a moment to reflect on the last few days in our lives and remember our need to seek God's forgiveness. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Our sins accuse us and we confess them to God. So let's return to the Lord and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. 
have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our Father forgive us our sins and bring us to the eternal joy of his kingdom, where dust and ashes have no dominion. Amen. And now we pray the Collect, the special prayer for today. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And now Paul Moss is going to read for us our first Bible passage for today. The first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Paul, thanks so much for that. And now Tina Woodhead is going to read our Gospel. The reading is taken from John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. For the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Tina, thank you so much for that reading. In the refugee camp in which I worked in, oh, nearly 40 years ago now, there was a hospital. And it wasn't until I climbed the massive fire tower that was close nearby, some months after I first arrived, that I realised that on the roof of the hospital was painted a huge red cross on a white background. Now, I hadn't realised this because, of course, from the ground level, it was totally invisible. Whether it is hospitals in refugee camps, ambulances in battle zones, or the International Relief Agency that bears the name, 
The Red Cross is an instantly recognised symbol that speaks of help and of assistance. And of course, the Red Cross is but one version of the symbol of the cross, a symbol that is central to our faith as Christians. And it might be worthwhile sometime just stopping for a moment and thinking, what does the sign of the cross mean to you? What do you think of when you see the cross? As Christians, we may well think that the cross speaks to us primarily of our salvation, of God's love through the willing self-sacrifice of his Son, Jesus Christ. It may be a sign that we trace on ourselves as we pray. It may be something that we wear around our neck. Or we may have the sign of the cross somewhere displayed in our house. The cross of Christ is right at the centre of our faith and we rightly venerate it. But all this may well obscure the fact for the, that for the very first Christian missionaries, the sign of the cross was something of a marketing nightmare. As I mentioned in my talk last Sunday, to those who first heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, well, it had none of those positive messages that you or I associate with it. Rather, it was the reverse because crucifixion was such an excruciating form of execution, and as such, it was reserved only for the worst of criminals. It was so barbaric that no Roman citizen was ever executed in this fashion. To anyone in the Roman Empire in the first century AD, the cross, well, it was a symbol of pain, of death, of defeat, and of shame. And to suggest that you should venerate the cross it's a bit like nowadays saying that we should put up an electric chair and use that as a symbol of devotion. And yet, and yet, those early Christians persisted with their apparently foolish message that the only way to be reconciled with God, the only true forgiveness that could be had, was dependent upon the death of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary and his resurrection. Now, when St. Paul wrote to his friends in the church at Corinth, and we heard a bit of that letter as our first reading that Paul read, he was concerned at a number of things that had been going on in the church. And certainly, it is likely that at least one of the problems that was present in that church was a tendency for the Christians there to think just a little too highly of themselves. And he has to remind his friends that before they became Christians, it didn't amount to very much in the eyes of the world. And really, that hasn't changed. But that is not to worry them. And they are not to, to be too concerned with ensuring that they're well thought of in the world. Why should that be? Well, the cross provides the perfect illustration of the way in which God so often chooses to work. You see, God has chosen to offer the gift of forgiveness and eternal life through the death of his son on the cross and his resurrection. His death, through which he takes upon himself our sins, and his resurrection, through which he offers us the hope of resurrection life, eternal life. But there is a real problem. This is a message that people find very hard to believe and to trust. Those like the Jews who looked to God to act in our world expected him to validate his work with signs and wonders. Those, on the other hand, whose delight was in sophisticated philosophy and wisdom would have looked for intellectual arguments and proofs. Now, for both these groups in the ancient world, the message of Jesus Christ, a Jew executed by the Romans, was a hard message to swallow. Why? Because it defied all their expectations of how God should act. The cross shows us the way in which God works, turns the ways of the world upside down, or, to put it as Paul does, the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The fact that the cross nowadays has such a positive message 
that it is used to adorn hospitals as a sign of help and assistance underlines the truth of what St. Paul asserts. Rather than effect his will through a great and powerful leader of nations with spectacular demonstrations of power, God has taken something shameful and fearful and he's used it at the center point of his plan for the salvation of the world. So when Paul writes to his friends in Corinth, he is trying to make them see that they do not have to be important or well thought of in worldly terms. If God can use the cross as the means of our salvation, he can use ordinary people, however humble, in his work in the world. And as we reflect on the cross of Christ today, it would be well to bear in mind our dealings with God. This simple maxim, expect the unexpected. For the cross shows us that the ways in which God works are so completely different from ours that they may well be totally unexpected. For centuries, people had been waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, and yet when he came in the form of Jesus, his life, his message, his death, and his resurrection were so unexpected that many people just did not recognize him. Now in this time of suffering that we are currently living through, it is perhaps worth remembering that one of the most unexpected aspects of the cross is this, that it is in suffering that God chose to reveal himself to us as our Saviour. It's in suffering that God chose to reveal himself to us as our Saviour. Far from being remote from the sufferings of his people, the cross demonstrates that in the depths of human suffering, God is present. God is with us. God is alongside us. And wherever people suffer, there God is present. The cross demonstrates that the way in which God works is the complete reversal of what we might imagine. The foolishness of God, wiser than man's wisdom. The weakness of God, stronger than man's strength. Or to put it another way, as we go about our lives this week, Look for God at work, but remember the cross, and do expect the unexpected. Now we're going to turn to God in prayers of intercession, and with confidence and trust, let us pray to the Father. For the one holy, catholic and apostolic church. Let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, In your mercy, hear us. For those preparing for baptism and confirmation, for their teachers, for their sponsors, let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. For peace in our world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, Let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, let us pray to the Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For those whom we have injured or offended, 
Let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. In communion with all those who have walked in the way of holiness, let us pray to the Father. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. God our Father, in your love and goodness you have taught us to come close to you in penitence, with prayer, fasting and generosity. Accept our Lenten discipline and, when we fall by our weakness, raise us up by your unfailing mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, trusting in the compassion of God, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Now let's share in the peace, shall we? Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord be with you.
And now we pray for God's blessing to rest upon us. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.